after dramatic statements at the highest levels. Professional diplomats have to pick up the pieces and explain in simple objective language what his commander-in-chief meant. This has yet to happen. Clearly, we need to strengthen our policy making and implementation mechanisms dealing with the West Philippine Sea in this country. The amateur hour, so typical of many of our efforts on maritime issues, has to end. The White Paper recommends the possibility of a crisis manage management committee being established in Malacanang to be headed by a retired diplomat with military experience, or conversely, a retired general with diplomatic experience to deal with critical situations on the West Philippine Sea. Finally, the Department of Foreign Affairs bears the brunt of implementing many of the major recommendations because of international implications of the issue. Our best and brightest diplomats should be assigned to China and to its allies, and to China's allies, and to the ASEAN countries, and to our possible allies in the, world, in the West Philippine Sea, Japan, India, the US, and some European countries, and others. We should select our most intelligent, charming, diligent, learned envoys to these countries where they can come back with vital information about developments on the South China Sea and contribute to peaceful settlement of maritime disputes. There should be no compromise with special connections and close relationships when selecting our ambassadors who deal with the West Philippine Sea. In this connection, I should like to pay tribute to Sonia Brady, our former ambassador to Beijing, who suffered a stroke while on duty, but who courageously went beyond the call of duty to go back to Beijing after serving in that post for several years. I knew Sonia when he just entered the home office around 1969, a bright, cheerful, diligent young officer full of hope and enthusiasm. Let us all hope and pray in conclusion that our ship of state, getting nearly 100 million Filipinos, will survive well its voyage on the turbulent, chaotic waters of the West Philippine Sea and reach port safe and sound to live in peace with its neighbors and with the rest of the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Senator Shahadi. I think uh, I remember I had a brief discussion about, um, I guess, the concerns about um, being very upfront and honest uh, and candid about what has to be done. But if you were to follow every step that Senator Shahadi has laid out for us, I think the Philippines would be in a much better position dealing with the South China Sea slash West Philippine Sea issue. And she did it, of course, in her personal capacity and with a lot of elegance. Uh, and I think maybe for, especially for those of us here who are thinking about the strategic options, the comprehensive and coherent way that the Philippines should proceed, I pay very close attention again to what the good senator shared with us uh, this afternoon. Now, um, before I proceed, need to uh, acknowledge a special guest who has joined us, uh, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Iran, uh, His Excellency Ali Mohammadi. Thank you for joining us. And I know a few more people have joined us uh, in this room. Please uh, pay close attention to, uh, to what has been said. So, uh, Senator Shahani has shared with us, I think from a domestic or national perspective, the need, very urgent, need to find or develop coherence in coming up with a national strategy, something that should involve the different players. And uh, I think you just go back to what she said, and if you follow everything, if we take advice, if we take that good advice, then the Philippines will be ready to take the next step, which is constructive engagement to develop the positive uh, opportunities for cooperation, or to at least to set you know, the boundaries straight or the situation straight in uh, the West Philippine Sea. And to help us 
think of these strategic options. I think the next discussion has, you know, comes from different perspectives, I think. Uh, and, you know, at the end of the day, I know that deep inside, there has this very strong feeling, well, well, very strong nationalistic feeling, but at the same time that, you know, there are realities, we are part of a community, and also that there are opportunities to be gained. So, uh, Secretary Alunan will share with us his perspective, his, you know, his reflections on how we could possibly uh, engage in constructive engagement uh, and explore possible cooperation or other options. Secretary Rafi. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank AAM for hosting this, and uh, I'd like to extend my thanks to Mike Luce who just left the room. Um, I'd like to begin on a very positive note, uh, and I'd like to state uh, for you a report that uh, on, on a conversation that the uh, incoming president uh, of China, Xi Jinping, had with uh, Secretary Mar Rojas when he was there uh, a few months ago. Uh, in that meeting, uh, which was intended to diffuse the then situation obtaining in the West Philippine Sea. Uh, President uh, Xi Jinping said that, well, he hoped that the situation would not reverse backwards and bilateral relations would come back to the track of normal development. And uh, he said that the China-Philippines bilateral ties have maintained the momentum of development since both countries uh, forged official diplomatic ties 37 years ago. And during that, discuss in that discussion, uh, the two uh, leaders uh, talked about bilateral cooperation in many fields. Um, and he cited that, uh, that during the visit of President Aquino to China in 2011, uh, both leaders, uh, President Aquino and President Hu Jintao, uh, reached important consensus on promoting bilateral cooperation and properly handling the issues concerning the South China Sea. And uh, that consensus was uh, aptly titled the 2012-2013 Philippines-China Years of Friendly Exchanges. Essentially an exchange project signed by the two presidents uh, when he visited, when President Aquino visited uh, on August 30, 2011. And uh, they cited the fact that the Philippines and China are close neighbors bound by centuries-old uh, friendship, trade and commerce, and people-to-people -people communications. President Aquino and President Hu also noted the two-way tourist arrivals uh, between the two countries and that they were hoping uh, that by 2016 tourism exchange uh, exchanges would reach the two million mark and that they were uh, looking at a trade uh, by that time of about 60 billion dollars between the two countries. Now, what areas uh, were they thinking about. Let me backtrack a bit. In 2005, the Special Envoy of the Philippines to China, uh, Ambassador Jose Antonio, identified four areas of uh, potential bilateral cooperation. And uh, I don't know whether this was actually carried out, but uh, uh, the four are medical tourism, infrastructure, mining, and pharmaceuticals. Subsequently, in 2009, there was a joint action plan for strategic cooperation signed by both countries. And this cooperation, uh, which they cited, covered just about uh, everything, uh, particularly increase in high-level exchanges and visits between leaders, cabinet members, legislators, judicial, defense, military, local government officials, the youth, entrepreneurs, educators, media personalities, and artists. And then they expressed support for the Philippines Public-Private Partnership Program, as well as strengthening cooperation in international uh, 
bodies such as the United Nations, APEC, the WTO, the Asia Europe meeting, meeting etc. Recently, the 18th uh, Foreign Ministers Conference explored specific mechanisms to help realize the agreements uh, between President Aquino and President Hu. As I mentioned, uh, it targeted 60, million, 60 billion in bilateral trade and 2 million two-way tourism arrivals by 2016. In my view, there are other areas for cooperation, and I would say that this would be breaking new ground. Um, one such area would be joint air-sea missions for maritime search rescue. As you know, uh, climate change has produced uh, extreme weather um, systems that have bounded just about every continent uh, in this planet. Uh, just recently, uh, in fact, we probably still have uh, Typhoon Pablo with us. Last month, uh, Hurricane Sandy pounded um, the United States, Eastern Seaboard, and places like India, China, uh, uh, Europe are quite familiar with tropical cyclones or hurricanes. Uh, China and the Philippines are also in the rim of fire, and, and therefore uh, we are regularly victimized by huge earthquakes. And in, in that particular area, um, China and the Philippines, and the littoral countries uh, around the South China Sea, would in fact band together and cooperate in natural disaster rescue relief rehabilitation missions. Uh, and utilize their military asset, uh, assets uh, to save lives and to save um, and, and, and to promote uh, bilateral and multilateral ties. The third area for joint cooperation is in the protection of coral reefs and endangered species in the South China Sea. Again, spawned by climate change. Uh, I, for the past 20 years, there have been consistent or persistent reports of dwindling fish catches, uh, forcing maritime nations to uh, go farther out and uh, eventually ending up in uh, the lo local uh, waters of uh, neighboring countries, and, and thereby in increasing the incidence of poaching. Um, now, for as long as climate change continues to batter our coral reefs, and uh, in the process, uh, reduce the number of fishing grounds, um, then fish catches as well as food for the, the people around the uh, South China Sea uh, will continue to dwindle. And unless there is joint international cooperation uh, to see how we could mitigate the impact of climate change and improve uh, food production, particularly uh, fish catches, uh, then the situation will continue to deteriorate. In fact, that's one of the main issues uh, uh, affecting the countries, the climate countries in the South China Sea. Fish, the issue of uh, fish catches. Who owns it? And as, as we engage in joint cooperation uh, in, in uh, in the maritime area, we can also have joint cooperation for food and energy security. Uh, we could extend that cooperation to, to cover food and energy security. Um, the trouble with that ideal, um, with those ideal proposals, is that the reality on the ground obstructs uh, countries uh, in the South China Sea from pursuing uh, those objectives. Um, the problem being that for the past <coughs> few years, the tensions between China and its neighbors have been increasing. Uh, it is evident in, uh, in the East uh, uh, China Sea, uh, the, or the Yellow Sea uh, with, with Japan. Uh, this is evident with Vietnam and recently uh, uh, 
uh, with India. It's definitely uh, quite evident with uh, the Philippines. Um, and for as long as these uh, tensions are there, it blocks the way for uh, moving forward, for, for developing deeper uh, bilateral and multilateral ties. Um, and these are the points that uh, I'd, I'd like the body here to discuss uh, during the uh, Q&A. And, and there are five questions I'd like to uh, focus on. First, I think we need to answer, where, where do our long-term interests lie? Second, who are we dealing with in China? Who are we calling the shots? Are we dealing with Beijing or are we dealing with the PLA? Or are we dealing with Hainan and Nansha local authorities? That's not clear. <coughs> and what would we do if China and Japan clash over Senkaku? Are we in a position to influence the situation and persuade and to help in the process? of persuading the two to restore peace, harmony, and stability in the region. And as Senator uh, Shahani adverted to, what should we be doing now and in the future in anticipation of China's con sovereign assertion over Baho de Masinlo and his practice? These are issues that uh, we need to reflect on. We have to discuss as a people, and uh, there are no easy answers. So I leave you uh, with that. On that note, thank you, thank you, Rashi. So um, I think we are getting more and more food for thought. I hope uh, your minds are still sharp, uh, and uh, we can get some more inputs uh, later. Uh, one important thing that uh, Rafi just uh, concluded with, one important point was who are we dealing with in China? In other words, there are some developments. But China is, uh, is, you know, is growing to be a superpower, both economically and militarily. Uh, they just, we just cannot ignore China. Um, and we really have to think about how you deal with China, how you engage China. Uh, both, I guess, in a uh, in a disciplined manner, uh, in terms of our strate our own strategic interests, but at the same time, what can cooperation with China offer us? And uh, I think that's what we have to start, you know, keep thinking about now. As we are getting uh, more and more information, more and more knowledge, I think we will have a more rich discussion. But the question of who we are dealing with in China now, and what you know, what should we know about China? What are the perspectives on China now? What are the realities? No? Uh, things that we can think about, you know, reflect on. It's something that uh, certainly this next discussant can share with us. Chito has lived China. In other words, he has, he has seen its, its evolution to what it is now from, uh, uh, I guess, from a very different China. Uh, uh, certainly in 37 years you do that uh, and with that I think there are certain uh, you know there, there's certain knowledge that you acquire not by reading and not by just observing but by really living it and I think that is what uh, what what Chito uh, Santa Roman offers with raw offers us today uh, so he is going to give us a perspective on the political landscape of China and perhaps other bits of information that, uh, that could be useful in understanding what we're dealing with and reaching uh, a fruitful conclusion to uh, our, uh, the, 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 the riddle of uh, the West Philippine Sea. So, uh, Chito.